Now by now you've probably already heard me singing the praises of microdosing and talking about the benefits I've experienced. If not, just know that all sorts of people, myself included, are microdosing to help with insomnia, anxiety, pain, workout recovery, and so much more. Our show today is sponsored by Microdose Gummies. Microdose Gummies deliver the perfect entry-level dose of THC to help you feel great without getting high from just one microdose. It's like the sweet spot between CBD and THC that gives you the benefits of both. A greater sense of calm, a mood lift, and a good night's rest. Microdose gummies are legal everywhere in the United States. And they're made with high-quality, organic ingredients, infused with real, organ-grown berries. They're a tasty treat that helps me wind down at the end of a long day. It's a win-win. So what are you waiting for? Microdose is available nationwide. To learn more about microdosing THC, go to microdose.com and use code MONSTERSAMONGUS to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Links can be found in the show notes, but again, that's microdose.com and the code MONSTERSAMONGUS. Now, as always, supporting our sponsors supports the show. So thank you for listening. Now, back to that spooky stuff. you don't scare too easily, because tonight's show is jam-packed with all sorts of creepy creatures, gnarly ghosts, dangerous demons, and even a Ouija board story. The two proves to be sinister. But before we get to all that, I want to begin with a UFO story of sorts. Well, something unidentified, where you'd least expect it. Please welcome tonight's first volunteer. Anonymous, out of the Empire State of New York. Hi, I just wanted to say big fan. Uh, I just started listening to the show maybe uh, it's about a year and a half ago, but I caught up on everything. I binged it. It's amazing. With that said, I grew up in a small town, a small uh, ocean town, so it was very, very populated in the summer, desolate in the winter. But, um, you know, everybody surfed. We all swam, we snorkeled. I mean, we were really like water guys. Uh, Even the girls, water people, if I may. With that said, it's uh, the town's Atlantic Beach Island, New York. And this happened to take place at the end of the summer, maybe going into like the last two or three weeks of the summer, on the bay at nighttime. My buddy and I were sitting in the car watching the bay now reynolds channel is a channel that was man-made i don't know how long ago 100 years ago 100 years plus but it is a channel that leads from the atlantic beach bridge you can go right out to the atlantic ocean um it'll take you out on one side the atlantic beach side nassau county and the right side is far rockaway queens and you could take that literally right out into the atlantic ocean and get to uh sandy Sandy Point or Sandy Hook, whatever it is, pretty quick. Or the or the Statue of Liberty, whatever else. Anyway, because this is a man made channel, the current is ridiculous. So ridiculous that we used to take current rides. We would jump in the water and uh, when the tide was coming in, especially on high tide, 
it would come in from the ocean and push the current west. So it would push it from Atlantic Beach. You can ride all the way down onto the AB Bridge, Atlantic Beach Bridge, into Long Beach, almost to Jones Beach, really. You could go. I mean, how you would get home is beyond me, but if you go a block or two, it's not so bad. And you could jump in and be a block or two in what seems like a minute. I'm talking the current is ridiculous. And if you have a west wind on top of it, Pat, you can't swim against it. I've seen kayakers go in thinking they're going to cross the channel and be under the bridge on the other side in, in a minute or two. So why do I mention this? Uh, so we're watching the water and flicking rocks in, seeing who could skip it the furthest, whatever it is that we do. And we see this thing approaching us from the west. So we're staring at the water. To our right is the Atlantic Beach Bridge. That's west. And the, the current is ripping west. Ripping. And this thing is breaking water and heading towards us. And it almost looks like an upside-down rowboat with the back out a little bit, if that makes sense. And I'm like to my buddy, hey, do you see that? And we're watching it, and we're blown away how, how not only is it moving against the current, it's moving pretty fast. It's actually causing white water to come off of it. So I'm like, what is that, a submarine? That's got to be a submarine, right? And then it happens. We see, like, this pink, I guess is the best color, light submerged under the water. And it just lights up for a second, like, boom. And we were like what, what was that that's what I thought I was like convinced it's a submarine I'm like it's got lights it's, it's illuminated but my buddy's like dude that's no submarine so as it's getting closer it starts to submerge slightly so now it goes from being like three feet out of the water to like a foot out of the water and then another boom pink light and then it submerges and we see like a bluish flash and this thing just takes off underwater I, it went so fast that if you've ever seen an inboard engine motor on a boat go from like slow to fast, it causes that like almost like an oil slick. The whole entire channel was like an oil slick pushed back. And this thing was gone. Within two minutes, a black helicopter comes over. Now, I hear myself saying this and I'm like, oh, I'm like embarrassed to even say this, but it was, it was a black helicopter. Not silent, like I, I thought it would be, right? You see it in the movies, it's silent, but, but pretty close to it. So I made a little noise, and it came flying by. It looked like a military helicopter. It wasn't like uh, you know a news helicopter or anything like that. And then about maybe a minute after that, NYPD helicopter, loud and with a big spotlight, is looking over the water. So I'm like, to my buddy, I'm like, that had to be like some kind of military submarine or something we just saw but you know it, it's just so absurd to think it's anything else but it couldn't have been a submarine like we went on a hunt you know i'm going back quite a bit so it wasn't so easy to hunt back then the internet wasn't so readily available you could use the internet but it wasn't like today but uh we've spoken to people we've spoken to military people my wife's brother my brother-in-law is uh pretty high up in the army i've told him this story but What's really crazy is after the NYPD helicopter came, maybe like 20 minutes later, there was like, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 people on a boat. We think it was a Coast Guard. It looked like a Coast Guard boat, but there was no Coast Guard emblems or anything. Like I, You couldn't really tell it was a Coast Guard boat. It was more like a rescue boat. It was exactly that. It looked like a police slash rescue boat, but it didn't have any names on it. And it came from the Queens Rockaway area from the ocean. So... Our assumption it was, you know, NYPD, but anyway, it was such a trippy thing. I hate to say that we saw a <laughs> submerged, unidentified object, but that's exactly what it was, right? So anyway, I thought that was a uh, pretty creepy story. Thanks, keep up the good work, and uh, I'll keep listening. Thank you, caller. Now, there's a lot for us to cover here, so I'm just going to jump right in. Now, I began my research by first bringing up Atlantic Beach, Long Island, on my Google Maps. And that's when I first noticed something strange. Now, I can't say for certain, but on Google Maps, in the satellite view, it almost looks as though the water has been airbrushed 
so that no submerged objects can be seen in the pictures. Now the water seems to be quite clear around the docks lining the channel and along the shoreline, but toward the center it gets suspiciously cloudy and brown. Well, maybe the water is just like that. Our caller did mention high currents in the area, but it certainly struck me as odd. And out of curiosity, I went over to Bing and did the exact same search. And they have a pretty distinct glare from the sun, which makes it impossible to see into the water from that image as well. And maybe it's nothing. But given what our caller had already told us, and what I'm about to tell you, maybe it is something. But let's reset and start at the beginning and get everyone caught up here. Now most would call what was encountered here a USO, an unidentified, submerged object. The crucial element in this video is the plunging into the ocean. Classifying this as a so-called transmedium UFO, an object that appears to possess amphibious capabilities. In other words, a USO, an unidentified submerged object. Now that clip courtesy of the television program the proof is out there. And sure, they can say anything they want on a History Channel show. Just because it's quote-unquote reality television doesn't make it a reality. But in this case, at least part of what the program claimed is true. At least according to the U.S. government. The following snippet was pulled from an interview of Luis Elizondo the former director of ATIP, a government-funded program designed to research UFO sightings and reports. This interview was conducted by Washington Post Live. There's two congruencies that we see. We see an interest in our nuclear capabilities, and then we have this really bizarre, I don't know if you call it an interest, but there seems to be a connection with water. And these things have, a, have a, a tendency to be seen in and around water, which, which kind of leads to one of the observables uh, that we've had. There's five distinct observables that set this technology, as I mentioned earlier, aside from everything we have in our inventory. The first is hypersonic velocity, the ability to change directions instantly. Um, and, and when I say instantly, I mean human beings can withstand about 9G forces. Uh, our, some of our best aircraft can withstand about 16 Gs. These things are doing three, four, 600 Gs uh, in mid-flight. Uh, then there's hypersonic velocity. Uh, that is speeds that by definition are Mach 5 or above, very, very fast. We do have some technology. You mentioned Russian hypersonics and things like that. You know, there, there are technologies that can go that fast, but then again, you don't expect a, a hypersonic aircraft to do a 90 degree turn. Uh, to put that into context, our SR-71 Blackbird, when at 3,200 miles an hour, wants to take a right-hand turn, it takes roughly half the state of Ohio to do it. You don't expect it to just kind of do this. Uh, and that's precisely what we're seeing. And then the third observable is a bit like cloaking. We call it low observability. But the fourth observable is what, what we were talking about, and that's transmedium travel and water. The ability for, for an object to fly not only in our atmosphere, low and high altitudes, but also potentially in a vacuum environment like space and even underwater. Now, we do have vehicles that can do that. We have, a, for example, an, a, a seaplane. A seaplane is, is a plane that can fly and it can float on the water. But when you look at it, it's neither really a very good aircraft or a boat because it's a design compromise. And yet what we are seeing are objects that can operate in all these domains or all these environments seemingly without any type of performance compromise. And so why are we seeing these things around in and around water is something that we're really we're really kind of scratching our heads with because we've seen these things they've been recorded not only in our atmosphere but there is data to suggest that they have also been tracked by some of our our capabilities underwater as well and being able to perform in ways that frankly exceed anything that we know we are on, on the planet right now. Now, I would be inclined to believe that there really is no difference between a UFO and a USO. Because it seems like he's saying the same craft is being observed in each location. And that the two are, in fact, one and the same. A UFO is just a USO that hasn't gone back underwater yet. At least that's what I took from that. 
and that would support the claim of many that the reason we cannot locate these unidentified objects is because they originate from deep beneath the ocean waves. Now here's the second half of that proof is out there clip with a suggestion as to where these things might go. USOs have been documented by the U.S. Navy for decades, including the famous Aguadilla incident off the coast of Puerto Rico in 2013. In that case, a DEA plane recorded this footage of an object circling the airport, then heading out to sea and entering the water at high speed, then re-emerging. One theory posits that ETs are either exploring the Earth's oceans as well as its skies, or that perhaps they have underwater bases we're unaware of. Maybe alien life forms could have made it to us, and if they got here, where would they go? They know we're intelligent. So they would go where we are not. And where we are not is in the deep ocean. Underwater bases certainly would explain a lot of this, wouldn't it? And we hear about these sorts of things from time to time. Or a lot if you watch shows like UFO Hunters or Ancient Aliens. But essentially, there are places on Earth where these objects are observed entering and exiting the water. Leaving many to posit that perhaps there is some sort of hub, mothership, or base hidden deep below. To places like Point Doom, here just off the coast of Malibu, California. The Solomon Islands, the Puffin Islands, or off the coast of Guantanamo Bay, over in Cuba. Also the deepest lake in the world, Lake Baikal in Russia, and also some of the largest lakes in the world, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Titicaca, and several other locations around the globe, suggesting there to be some sort of network of these bases strategically placed throughout the planet. Now I even found a claim that suggests that a supposed USO base that sits just off the coast of Mexico helps protect the region from oncoming hurricanes. Now apparently that's been true since the mid-60s when it was believed the base was developed and built. Previous to that, that area, Ciudad Madero, to be specific, was regularly pummeled by storms previous to that date. Now is that a coincidence or is that proof that something is hidden beneath the waves? So to bring this full circle, Perhaps our caller and his buddy saw one of these craft, whatever they are, in, for some reason, a man-made channel. As unusual as that may seem, run-ins with these mysterious objects do occur beneath the surface. And sometimes these run-ins can be quite significant. A Russian nuclear sub encountered a formation of what appeared to be alien spacecraft at depth under the water. At a depth of approximately 260 meters, crew aboard a fully weaponized Russian nuclear submarine detect six unknown objects on their sonar. What's even more alarming is the speed at which the objects are traveling, in excess of 265 miles per hour. The captain, fearing that a collision was imminent and that he was under attack, ordered an emergency surfacing of the submarine. The submarine finally breaches the surface narrowly avoiding a collision. But what happens next is even more astonishing. Six objects come out of the water and take off at some absurdly fast speed. One can only speculate about the intent of these USOs. Was this a hostile act of some sort, or were they just fleeing detection? Now that clip on behalf of Quest TV. And though this incident is still shrouded in mystery, that might not be the only time humans have made contact with USOs. The U.S. Navy says one of its attack submarines struck an unknown object while submerged in the South China Sea. The incident happened last Saturday, but was not publicly disclosed until yesterday for security reasons. Navy officials say it's not yet clear what the USS Connecticut hit, but they say it was not another submarine. Nearly a dozen sailors were hurt, but they're all expected to be okay. The submarine remains fully operational. Damage is still being assessed. Now that clip property of the Today Show and the event in question occurred somewhere in early October of 2021. 
so I don't know what our caller saw, but I do know that things are regularly seen in our waters, and on rare occasions, contact is even made. What those things are, however, deciding that is above my pay grade. But we do thank you, caller, for giving us the opportunity to deep dive on this subject, and I promise you, this won't be the last time that we do. Thank you again, caller, for the entry. Now, speaking of entries, if you have one you'd like to share, a true story, that is, call our toll-free hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 888-608-NIGHT. Or email an audio file to monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com. Now, next up, we venture down to Arkansas, where Tatiana is a very intense call to share. Hey, Derek, this is Tatiana from Arkansas. I'm calling to share an experience my friend had. Over this past weekend, I decided to spend the night with her. Um, And while we were sitting on the porch having a few drinks, she decided to share this experience she had had with me about seeing a demon in her boyfriend's house. She said that they were laying in bed one night asleep, and she heard this ruckus coming from the living room. So she kind of turned over to face the door frame, and then she hears this thump, 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 thump. So she opens her eyes, and she sees standing in the doorway this demon on all fours in the shape of a woman, very pale. She said kind of reptilian eyes, you know, with the the yellowish green and the slit. Um, And she said that this woman had pointy red hair and very sharp teeth and that this demon looked at her in the eyes and was like, I'm going to get your boyfriend, little bitch. I don't care if you like it or not. So she rolls over and she says this is when she realizes that she's not asleep because she puts her hands on her boyfriend and she just starts praying, starts rebuking this demon in the name of Jesus Christ and prays until she falls asleep. And so the next morning she wakes up and tells her boyfriend this and her boyfriend laughs it off and tells her, you know, you're being crazy. This isn't real. Well, two weeks later, he ends up seeing her as well, describes her the same way on all fours crawling like a spider, pale, red pointy hair, reptilian eyes, the sharp teeth, and that she spoke to him as well and told him that she was not going to stop coming after him and she doesn't care about his religious, God-loving girlfriend. It wasn't going to stop her. So yeah, that's my story. Thankfully, when she told me that, we were not at that specific house. She thinks that he might have picked it up one day and brought it home with him. She's not really sure, but... She's since then moved out because she couldn't stand the type of person he was becoming. So, yeah, that's my story. It's really creepy, and I love the podcast. Thank you for all your hard work. Have a good night. Thank you, Tatiana. Now, with that new Exorcist movie coming out, possession, particularly of the demonic variety, seems to be back in vogue but it's not all that often that you hear about it in the real world. And that seems to be what we're discussing here with Tatiana's call. Right. After all, she does include that her friend's boyfriend's behavior did change significantly, to the point that she ended the relationship. It certainly is a trope of demon possession. But look, I'm certainly not in any position to determine what exactly went down in this story but I am thankful that Tatiana shared it here with us and that I was able to include it here on a spooky season episode. So thank you again, Tatiana, for calling in. Now this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you ever feel like your brain is getting in its own way? Like you know what you should do, what's good for you, but you just can't do it. And I know all too well what that's like. And if you're going through something similar, know that you're not alone. Therapy can help you figure out how to stop self-sabotage and find some mental and emotional peace. Now, therapy has not only helped me during rough times, but it's also given me the tools I need to respond to future difficult situations in a much healthier way. Now, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try 
It's entirely online, which makes it convenient, flexible, and affordable. And if for some reason you're not vibing with the therapist you're matched with, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash Monsters Among Us today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash Monsters Among Us. As always, supporting our sponsors supports the show. So thank you for listening. Back to that thing creeping around your garbage cans. Now speaking of spooky season, fall has finally hit us up here on the mountain, and all the trees that do so have already begun changing colors. Lots of yellow oaks, but a few maple trees that people have in their yards, with vibrant orange and red colored leaves. Well, the point being that it feels like fall, and it feels good. But while you're out there looking at the leaves, be sure to pay attention to your surroundings because you have no idea what else might be out there. Just ask D out of Idaho. Hey there, this is D again from Idaho. I, I don't know if this is a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or something. This is my dad's story, it's a second hand story. I wasn't there when he experienced this. But this takes place up in Northern Idaho, kinda up by St. Mary's, in between St. Mary's and Wallace, if you know where that is, near the Montana border. And he was up turkey hunting with his brother and their dad. And he was sitting in like a little makeshift line that he made out of some pine limbs that had fallen on the ground. This was the fall turkey season, so it was cold, it was snowy already, and there were pine limbs on the ground, and he kind of made a makeshift blind out of that, er, and his brother and his dad went out, and they were trying to just actually find some turkeys, and he was just sitting in that blind in the same spot, and he heard what he described as a, like a snorting sound, kind of like what you'd imagine a wild hog would sound like down in the south, but this is northern Idaho, where there's no wild hogs, as far as he knows. And then he heard this deep, guttural roar, almost, from, he doesn't know how far out, but it sounded close. And he was absolutely terrified. He thought, like his mind immediately went to a black bear or maybe a grizzly. There are grizzlies up in that part of the state or maybe even a moose. But when this thing walked out into a little clearing, he saw it and it was not a bear. It was not a moose. He, the only way that he could describe it is the Sasquatch. Pretty much. It was a lot taller than he was it probably seven and a half or eight feet tall and he's six foot one and this thing just towered over him he knew it was huge and he was absolutely terrified and he froze up and this thing walked past him and it was making noises like a hog and it was also roaring every once in a while and he just let it walk past and then he never saw it again and he hopes to never see it again so that's just my dad's story. He let me call it in. He told me to call it in. I got him into the podcast. And thank you for this podcast where I can share stories of my family and their paranormal experiences so that we don't seem crazy. All right. I'll see you. Thank you, D. Now, as far as Sasquatch activity is concerned, that part of the country is pretty quiet the Idaho, Montana area. Not to say that encounters don't happen there. They do from time to time, as D here can attest. But not as often as other parts of the country. But why is that, you may be asking? Maybe the lower population of the area means less people there to likely run into one of these creatures. Or maybe they don't live there at all. And the few encounters that are experienced are of creatures simply passing through. Now, either way, we thank you, Dee, for adding another data point 
to our research and allowing me to bring the lack of sightings in that area to our attention. And if you happen to be from that area and you do have an experience, please prove me wrong. Now this next entry originates from that particular region I just spoke about with Dee's entry. This one, however, was submitted by Laurel from up in Big Sky Country. Hi, my name is Laurel in Montana. I just started listening to your show and I love it so far. It's so great. And I just wanted to call in and tell a story that I had when I was a kid in Summers, Montana. Um, my mom and I would sleep out in the living room quite a bit. We lived in this little rancher and I was on sleep on the couch facing out towards the kitchen and the kitchen stove light was on and I noticed a shadowy pitch black arm sticking out of the wall (laughs) and it kind of would it would be between the wall and the fridge. I don't know if I'm describing that good enough, but I was just yeah looking at this dark pitch black arm for what felt like a really long time. And then I noticed that the arm was holding something and I was thinking that looks like a brain. <laughs> but as strange as that is I didn't feel afraid of it. I just was more like curious, trying to like, you know, however a child's mind can understand something like that. Yeah, just really weird experience. Um, I eventually drifted off to sleep, I think. And yeah, I uh, I remember it very vividly. It's just, yeah, I haven't seen a shadowy limb since. But I've definitely had some other strange experiences up in that area. Really cool, beautiful place to live, but definitely some weird experiences growing up there. Again, I love the show. I'm going to start binge listening into it more. And uh, thanks. Bye. Thank you, Laurel. I don't recall hearing any other calls regarding a disembodied arm. I do, however recall hearing a couple disembodied head stories, and quite a few that seemed to depict just the bottom half of a human. Just the legs. Oh, and there was also a little green butt that ran across the road, down in Alabama, I believe. Man, that call came in half a decade ago or so. The point being that we've heard similar stories, similar reports. And I hope that that helps you feel a little less alone in this experience, Laurel. Because frankly, your experience is a mystery. But perhaps there's some solace in knowing you're not the only one. Thanks again for calling in. Now what would a spooky season episode be without the mention of a Ouija board? So let's mark that spot on our blood-covered bingo cards with this entry from Nathan, down in Mississippi. Hey Derek, this is Nathan from Jackson, Mississippi again. This is a personal story coming from me about why I never will touch a Ouija board again. I was about seven years old when I made a friend at school who was also into the paranormal as much as I was when I was younger. I remember specifically, we were talking one day and he was super excited and he came to me and he was like, dude, I got a Ouija board. Do you want to come over and use it? And me being a stupid little kid was like, um, yes. So I asked my mom if I can go over that day. She said, of course. And we went on over to his house. So the minute we got there, I went into his room and he had it all set up. His room was darkened with no lights the window was covered there were candles around the Ouija board and I could almost immediately feel the tension just start on me you know it was this constricting feeling this dark feeling this like someone 
put their hands around me and just started squeezing really hard. Anyway, we start using the board and we don't immediately get a response, but it took about 10 minutes and we finally got a response. And it was, you know, the normal, is anyone here? Yes. And immediately being the skeptic, that I could, could sometimes be when I was younger. I looked about him. I was like, are you moving it? Seriously. I'm trying to be serious here. <laughs> Don't move. And he was like, dude, I'm not moving it. I swear. So I believed him and we kept talking. And like most Ouija board stories, the conversation soon takes a dark turn. I'm, I'm sorry. I I'm shaking remembering all of this. Uh, at the time of this, I was and still am a devout Christian, but at the time I was wearing a necklace with the cross on it. The Ouija board started spelling out, what was it? Neck or cross or something. It was one of the two, but... I could tell it was talking about what was around my neck. And then out of nowhere, it all stops. And then the last thing the board said was, kill you. And the next thing I know, my friend screams, dude, watch out. He had a lamp sitting in the corner of his room, this big one that just lit up the room. It pushed over and the rim of the lamp where the light bulb goes hit me in the back of the head. Like, this didn't knock me out, but it hit me so hard that I was dazed and on the ground. I, I, I can never forget that day. I never and will never wear necklaces again. And I know, that, I know that's silly sounding, but it's just had this horrible effect on me and to this day I feel like I can still feel that dark presence you know uh, but that's my story and warning to anyone out there that is thinking about using one of these boards to not do it anyway that's my story Derek I hope you enjoyed it man keep doing what you're doing and keep the podcast going all right man see ya Thank you, Nathan, for calling in. Wow, Nathan. I've always heard that playing with a Ouija board can be dangerous. But I didn't know they meant physically. And I'm glad that it was only a lamp and not the grandfather clock or something. Having a scar and a scary story is one thing. Getting squished by a 500-pound wooden clock, well, that would be a whole nother level. So heed Nathan's warnings, and while you're at it, thank him for sharing his tale here with us tonight. Now folks, real quick before we move forward, a little reminder that the Monsters Among Us shop is fully stocked for the spooky season. Visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and click on the shop tab today to pick up an assortment of t-shirts, hats, bags, posters, koozies, stickers, patches, pins, and probably a whole lot more. And if you plan on putting a bigger order together, might I suggest signing up for Patreon first? Because listening to one of the recent episodes will give you a discount code to save 10% off your purchase. So that might not only save you a few bones, but get you access to the Beyond episodes for practically free. Again, that's MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and click the Shop tab. All items shipped from right here in our basement workspace by my better half Sarah and all proceeds go to support the show except for a little bit from each poster sale that goes to the Navajo Water Project a nonprofit organization that helps bring water to those in rural areas beginning with the amazing people of the Navajo Reservation oh and they come automatically autographed by me so add one to your order today Now I have one more story to touch on before we go to break. So let's get after it. Here with a beastly entry is Alan. 
from down in Texas. Hey, Derek and all. This is Alan in Texas. Uh, I wanted to call a sighting and it's sort of in the vein of the uh, secret entry on the transportation episode by Jesse. Uh, she was calling from North Texas. Mine uh, took place in Southeast Texas. So this is probably about 2012-ish. Uh, I was driving a truck for an oil field company and regularly made the trip from Houston to New Iberia, Louisiana, and back all in a single day, which is about nine, 10 hours, depending on traffic and lunch and unloading, all that kind of stuff. So this particular day, I was uh, about two thirds of the way between Houston and Beaumont, and the Interstate I-10 was under construction at that point and kind of narrowed down to a normal two-lane, each-direction kind of highway. I don't even think they had an actual middle barrier at that point because of the way the construction had uh, diverted traffic. So I was able to see the opposite shoulder really clearly, you know, about 40, 50 feet away. And right on the shoulder, just barely off of the white line, uh, I saw a dead creature about the size of a cow, but it was not a cow. And the way that it was facing, its head was towards me, essentially, kind of facing the eastbound traffic and towards the highway. So got a really good look at the face, and I'll describe the body first and come back to the face. It, it was about the size of a cow, uh, shaggy hair, something like what you would see on a... Uh, Irish wolfhound, uh, about that length and texture, and brown and black brindle color. I know it sounds like I'm describing a large dog at this point, but the face was a bit different. If you look up a picture of a short-faced bear reconstruction, which was an Ice Age animal in North America, look that up and then combine it with the wargs on the Lord of the Rings series. That's essentially what it was. About that build, about that color, about that, you know, shaggy coat. Not a dog, not a cow, uh, but about the size of a cow. You know, too large to be a dog. So that was about eight in the morning. And coming back about two or three in the afternoon, there was zero evidence that the thing had ever been there. It was gone, no blood. No, nothing. I slowed down uh, a lot because of the traffic at that point, and it was completely gone. So I know that's a really simple sighting, but uh, yeah, just wanted to share that as further evidence for Jesse's call. Uh, thanks again for all you do. Thank you, Alan. A good old-fashioned rogue kill mystery, and I'm here for it. So let's break this down, shall we? First, let us start with the location. Texas. Southeast Texas, to be specific. And let's begin with a list of animals known to inhabit that region that also might be mistaken for a cow-like monster in a roadkill setting. The obvious large mammals include cougar, bobcat, coyote, peccary, which is a pig-like creature found throughout the American Southwest, and the white-tailed deer. The only one on that list that even remotely matches the description would be the peccary. But I'll be honest, the size Alan described does not seem to match up with the peccary. The javelina, if you will. Which only gets to be about four feet long and about 90 pounds. In my mind, that's about half the size of what he was describing. But any Texan worth their salt knows that I'm forgetting a creature. An animal that, although is not indigenous to the area, can now be found in abundance not only across Texas, but across much of the United States. The feral hog. Now, feral hogs are the descendants of farm hogs that were either released or escaped, and they've now grown to troubling numbers. And their size, resilience, and aggression makes them a very dangerous and destructive animal. The largest wild hog ever taken weighed in at nearly 800 pounds and was shot in De Leon, Texas, back in 2015. Only some 300 miles from where Alan had his run in. But I hear what you're thinking. There's no way a Texas man like Alan is going to misidentify a hog. 
Everyone in the Lone Star State is familiar with these troublesome animals. But what if it was a more exotic breed of pig? One with long curly locks all over its body. The Mangalitsa is a breed of Hungarian domestic pig. The Mangalitsa pig grows a thick woolly coat similar to that of a sheep. The Mangalitsa is the last pig in existence to sport this unusual fleece and it was nearly lost to extinction by the 1990s when fewer than 200 pigs remained in Hungary. Its name means hog with a lot of lard. There are currently three existing varieties of Mangalitsa, differing only by color. They are blonde, swallow-bellied, and red. Now that clip comes to us from the channel Livestock Breeds on YouTube. And if you check out the video in the show notes, you'll see some woolly swine. Some of these things almost look like sheep. They have so much hair or wool or whatever it's called in this situation. Now my research assistant Delaney spent some time digging into this story as well. And she came up with an entirely different suspect. Now I've not spent a ton of time in Texas, but it's my understanding that some folks down there purchase exotic animals and then set them loose in the backcountry to let her be hunted, safari style, from the bed of a pickup truck and a military grade rifle, just like our ancestors intended. Now there are all sorts of creatures that have been released, and most seem to be ungulates, deer, elk, sheep, antelope. In fact, Delaney even supplied me with a list of species known to have been let go down there. Thompson's gazelle, owldad sheep, axis deer, black buck antelope, mouflon sheep, and a strange looking creature called the Nilgai. Now I say strange because its body looks just like a cow. It's more stocky, it's muscular and boxy, not sleek and slender like most deer and antelope are. But the weird thing about this animal is that it seems to have the head of a goat. A much smaller goat because the head on this thing is 10 to 15 percent smaller than it probably should be that or the body is bigger either way it doesn't seem to be a clean match now this thing is the largest antelope in asia and it stands five foot at the shoulder and can weigh in as much as 700 pounds they are rather large and they are dark in color with long stringy hair in certain parts of its body. And according to Texas Tech University, there are as many as 15,000 of these things running around the state of Texas. So could one have stumbled out into oncoming traffic, only to later be found by Alan along the side of the road. And you know, I assume the meat of this animal would be quite valuable. After all, people do pay to hunt them. So perhaps someone in the know circled back and collected the carcass. Believe it or not, I knew all sorts of people back home that enjoy roadkill cuisine. Just don't worry about the legality of that practice. But you know this is a program about monsters, mysteries, and the unexplained. So I'd like to dangle one more possibility out there for you to ponder tonight. While you lie silently in your bed, waiting for the shadows to whisk you off to dreamland. It's a southeast Texas legend called the Bear King of Marble Falls. In the area of Marble Falls, a tribe of Kickapoo people had a local legend known as the Bear King. The creature ruled over all the bears in the region. According to newspapers in 1901, allegedly including the San Francisco Chronicle. A local woman named Ramey Arland was abducted by the Bear King and described the creature as a bear man that ran on all fours. The next day, a local hunter found the woman wandering the woods, saying she escaped from the creature. Armed with weapons, a group of men tracked the creature to the cave Arland said it was in. When they found the Bear King, it began to growl like a panther and beat its chest. Hesitant to kill it as it resembled a human, the man eventually shot it after the creature charged. 
the story doesn't explain what happened to the body, but a local brewery is named after the cryptid to keep its spirit alive. Now that info courtesy of Caller Times. Now granted, this legend originates some 200 miles west of the location of Allen's discovery. But look, Texas is a big place. So down there, 200 miles, it ain't nothing. Well, thank you again, Alan, for taking the time to share this mystery. Have a look at the show notes and see if one of our guesses might hit the nail on the head. Okay, so a little inside baseball here. Sometimes I get a call in that I just know is going to be popular with the listeners. On those calls, I always include the word good in the description. Not that I don't think the others aren't good, but when I'm looking for something a little over the top, something to punctuate an episode, all I have to do is search for the word good, and all those calls show up. Well, this is one of those good calls. One that ices your blood or maybe makes your hair stand up on end. Miss Emma, please tell them while your story meets that criteria. Well, hello. This is Miss Emma, and I am a repeat offender from all over the East Coast. I, today, have decided to share a story of my mother's. So, the beginning of this story is is not mine, and in the theory, it's not even hers, it's my uncle's. But at the end of the story, I come in and have, you know, a closing ceremony, if you will, with it all. So my mother grew up partially in Lebanon, Connecticut as a young child in a very rural area with a town with one stop sign in the middle where the the general store was kind of situation. And she had a very large family. Now, my grandma had some questionable relations in life, but one of these questionable relations got her and her children a big house. And there was many odd things about this house, and my mom always has different bad experiences or about different parts of it. But specifically the stairs was an area where my uncle Kevin, when he was very young, I want to say four or five, he would fall down the stairs a lot. And then it began that he would just fall down a lot. My grandmother took him to doctors. Now, mind you, this is like, you know, the early 60s. So who knows what they were trying or testing or their theories were. But either way, they thought nothing was wrong with him. And they thought maybe he was just trying to get attention. And so every time he would fall, you know, he would get in trouble. And finally, he expressed one day that he was very upset because it's not him, it's Holly. My grandma asked Uncle Kevin, well, who's Holly? And he goes, he's the man who pushes me down the stairs. He's the one who's pushing me all the time. It's Holly. Now, this was just kind of a weird thing for him to say like who's Holly they knew lots of people the house always had visitors and family coming and going but who the heck is Holly so fast forward many years later and my mom was looking through old photos left over from when my grandmother was alive and in one of these photos there was a group shot of them on the second story all the children and their mother against a large window and It was a floor-to-ceiling kind of window, so, you know, you could easily see right behind them all the way down to the ground where their feet stood. And mind you, again, this is a second-story shot. My mom said, standing outside the window on the second story in their group picture was a little Victorian boy, perfectly dressed like a Victorian boy, about between, like, five and nine, you know, just floating, floating outside the window, clear as day in the photo. Now, unfortunately, those photos got destroyed at a certain point and they don't exist or I would send it to you but my mom is not one to make things like this up and she's also a highly sensitive person so I believed her I believed this story growing up my whole life and then when I was 15 I went to upstate New York to see my aunt and we drove down to their old house in Lebanon Connecticut just to see it we were going to visit a grave or something from a great aunt who had recently passed and she thought we might as well drive by the old house So we do so, 
and it seems pretty empty, so we just decide to get out. Mind you, this is a rural area. Sometimes you can just get out and walk up to strangers' houses, and no one bats an eye. You might even get invited in for tea. So we go, and we knock on the front door, and there's no answer. And then we hear hollering from a side door off to, like, kitchens used to be built on the outside of the back of the house, so the heat didn't fill at all. And so this is one of those ground-level dirt floor rooms, and there was a, like, kind of barn door style thing locked from the outside locked from the freaking outside so we go over to that side and that's where we hear the voice and the voice is coming from halfway down the door I imagine it was an older woman in a wheelchair of some kind and she's just saying who's there so my aunt told her hello this is my name I used to live here and I brought my niece to come and see the home like would you mind if we come inside and the old woman says no and just so you know Holly doesn't live here anymore. I turned around with my aunt and we walked pretty briskly back to the car and we never really spoke about it, but my aunt was clearly shaken and I knew enough of the story to be completely taken aback when the stranger mentioned it to us because they did not share the story with people in town. All right, so a little more info on my grandma. Which is that my grandma is from a line of people who like were part Native American, were also Gaelic and English, and so we had some ancestors come over on the Mayflower. So like my ancestors were up in the area of Maine, New York, and Connecticut for hundreds of years, <laughs> and Massachusetts, even the settlers, was hundreds of years, and before that, like yeah, our Native tribe has been there for you know thousands. <laughs> also, some name drops. Uh, very unknown, but we're part of the Mi'kmaq tribe, which is uh, pre-colonial or pre-Columbian contact, rather. So before, quote-unquote, America was discovered. But anyway, so we have a lot of ties to that area. And Holly is a like English-Irish name of origin. So it's very possible that, you know, there were little children with the name Holly who maybe didn't survive that era of time. As we know, children didn't always make it very far, but... um. Yeah, my grandma was a born-again Christian later in life, but she was very much practicing witchcraft, I believe, at the time she lived in this house. And my parent, my mother was a child there. So, you know, there's definitely, like, open portals. And my whole family is very, like, psychic and uh, spiritual and magical. Most of us are highly sensitive people, especially the women. Anyway, so, you know, it kind of adds up. It's a period-appropriate name from the kind of settlers who often would come into that area at that time. Yeah, and to mention again, the little boy in the photo who was standing outside the window, he was standing behind my Uncle Kevin. Yeah, so just kind of a strange thing and just seemed so odd that after, you know, my aunt not having been back to that home since they were, since they had left in their early 20s, it was just really surprising even for me knowing these stories to hear this strange woman in a weird room that was original, an originally built house, you know, the house looked decrepit, um, locked from the outside, just screams at us, strangers, Holly doesn't live here anymore. I was I was just like, oh my gosh, yeah. So it made sense that my aunt just wanted to run. It's also the kind of person she is, she's just not going to talk about these things, you know. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. It's a very odd kind of situation, very odd home. There's lots of other stories from that place and that time. If I can get my mom to start talking and call in one of these days. Yeah, so that's my story. Hope it's at least a little spooky. Have a great day. Thank you, Emma. Now I think of Holly as a last name in this instance. As in Buddy Holly. So perhaps this was an adult Little Uncle Kevin claimed pushed him down repeatedly. Maybe the little boy in the photo is somehow unrelated. But as mysterious as all this is, that's not even my biggest question. That would be this. If the family lived in the home previous to the old lady living there, how did that old woman know about Holly? And why did she speak of Holly as though the person once physically lived in the home, insinuating that she either knew the person, lived with the person, or that possibly experienced the haunting herself. 
Honestly, the only way I can make this timeline work in my head is that Holly was somehow haunting the home while he or she was still living. That's the only way this timeline makes any sense to me. And if that is true, we might as well burn all the books we have about ghostly activity because I'm pretty sure it's not supposed to work like that. Now, of course, it's also possible that the story is fabricated, though I don't think it is, or that it's simply a coincidence, which may be true, but it would be a long shot. Unless, of course, Holly is a very popular name in those parts. If I'm back home, there's a few names that I could utter in any century. It would garner a lot of attention. Families in small towns tend to stick around. There are plenty of hazes in southeast Ohio that prove my point. But I don't know. There's a lot here that needs to go right. And if I'm going to use Occam's razor to debunk certain calls, it needs to go both ways. So are those wild coincidences more likely than both the old lady and little Uncle Kevin knowing about an entity named Holly? I have to say now. Now, of course, none of this does anything to solve the riddle. But I like that it forces us to ask some interesting questions about time and the paranormal. But I'm afraid that's a conversation for a sharper mind than mine. But thank you, Emma, for coincidentally creeping us out. Now before I play this final call, a reminder that you can catch our film Shadows in the Desert High Strangeness in the Borrego Triangle on Thursday, November 2nd at the Salina Arts Center in Salina, Kansas. And afterward, you can attend a digital Q&A. Go to borregotriangle.com, B-O-R-R-E-G-O, and click the See It in Theaters tab to pick up tickets. And I'm still working on that Boise, Idaho screening. Nothing is locked down just yet, but hopefully we'll have an announcement for you soon. Now, for that final call of the evening. From Parts Unknown, please join me in welcoming Raven to the program. Hello there, my name is Raven, and me and my mother both absolutely love your podcast. I have quite a few supernatural experiences that I've had throughout my life, but the very first one that I can remember is the first one that I will share with you. Just for placement and context of where I grew up, I was born and raised in Northern California, and that is where this story took place. I was about five or six when this happened. I was in second or third grade at a summer camp. And at the time, I didn't have many friends at the summer camp, but I had this one friend who believed that she was a witch. We're all kids at this time. I used to make up lies all the time just to make life fun. You know, we do that when we're kids, or at least I just did that. (laughs) But anyway, I just went along with it. She said she wanted to make her own little grimoire or a book of shadows, magic book, whatever. And at the time, I loved to draw. I was obsessed with dragons. And I said, hey, as long as you are willing to let me illustrate your book and draw a bunch of dragons in it, I am so here to help you. And she was all for it. So we were making that book. And one day she came to that little summer camp with a spell that she had written to bring forth the image of a unicorn. And of course, us little kids, wanted to see a magical unicorn galloping through the sky or something. I've always been a very fantasy-loving, big imagination type of person and kid. So I was into this. And basically what we needed for the spell was something of every color. didn't really matter what it was. It needed to be heated up on a hot surface. And we needed to say an incantation that my friend had written. So at the time, we were the only ones outside in the playground because it was super hot out and just so you get an image of what it looked like it was wood chips under our feet and there were these logs that lined the square edges of this playground and there was this 
blue rocking airplane that was super hot from the sun. So we collected little items that we found around in different colors, whatever worked. We put it on this blue airplane. We set our little incantation and we waited. And of course, I'm hoping to see a dragon or something of that kind. And she is looking around for her unicorn. And after, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds to a minute or so, when we're about to give up and go back inside, I turn around and just on the other side of the log, maybe a couple feet away from me, a yard or two, there is a transparent figure that is about my height. Its eyeline was directly across from mine, right in line with mine. And this creature stood on its back legs, very humanoid, but it was absolutely covered in spines, like little spikes. A good comparison that I have would be the horned toad, which is a type of lizard that lives in the desert and actually shoots blood out of its eyes. I thought that was a cool little (laughs) animal note. But anyway, this creature freaked me the heck out. And at the time, I was also being raised very Christian by my dad. So anything spooky was a demon, was the devil. So that's exactly what I thought it was. And when I told my dad about it, he told me never to talk to that girl again, which I already didn't want to do. But looking back over the years on that memory, I didn't feel any malicious intent from this entity. I saw it clearly. My little witch friend at the time did not see it at all. And I just have no idea what it could be. I have been thinking that it could potentially be some kind of fey folk or something of that sort. Because we definitely called something force. Our spells certainly worked. But I have never seen it since. It didn't attach itself to me, anything like that. But... To finish off the actual story itself, too, I looked at this creature. When I turned and I looked at it, it looked me right in the eyes, and then it turned and walked away and just disappeared. It vanished. And then, of course, I ran screaming back inside. But that's it. That's my first story. I'm curious to see your take on it or if anyone else has seen anything close to this. But yeah, thanks for doing a great job on this podcast. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Raven. What the hell was that? Before we go much further, for those that are unfamiliar with the term grimoire, let's get you caught up to speed by none other than the man that wrote the book on the subject. Literally. Owen Davis, author of Grimoires, A History of Magic Books, courtesy of the Oxford University Press. My name is Owen Davis, and I've written Grimoires, A History of Magic Books. I think most people are probably familiar with the word grimoire, particularly from such shows as Buffy and Charmed, where these books are central to the plot. But what are they? Most people are a bit unsure, I think. Well, essentially, they're magic books, books of conjurations, of spells, of charms, for such things as treasure hunting, for love, for all sorts of desires, for the need to survive in a chaotic world against illness, against spirits, against witches. These are books which are often attributed to great mythic characters or biblical characters like Moses or Solomon, great King Solomon. And... The knowledge they contained was secret knowledge. It was only held by a few. Grimoires were only ever possessed by a small percentage of the population. Yet the magic they contained were used for the masses, for the needs and catering for the desires of the main bulk of the people of the populations of the countries from the Middle East through our North Africa into Europe and across the Atlantic. Okay, seriously. What was that thing? All sorts of scenarios flood my mind. A botched alien abduction by the reptilian race. Another of these toad creatures that we've heard about in the past. You may recall one being stabbed by a young boy with his father's bone-handled knife from season 13, episode 18, for those that want to go back. 
Or, you know, Raven had mentioned that the creature was translucent. So maybe this was the Glimmer Man creature we so often discuss these days. Or this just could be something more primeval than all of that. Now, given the situation here, the grimoire and the spell they seem to cast, maybe this was simply something conjured up in the girls' minds, manifesting as either some sort of shared daydream. In other words, they imagined it. Or, maybe there was some magic in that book. Magic with a K. And maybe the girls did conjure up a botched attempt at a unicorn. Some folks may toss the Tibetan word tulpa around in a situation like this. For those unfamiliar with that term. A tulpa is an entity created out of one's mind. Some people believe a tulpa exists only in the mind while others think that they can become separate from their quote-unquote host and even leave their body. That info according to our friends at How Stuff Works. Now the point here is that I have no idea what Raven experienced. But I do know that this will not be the last we hear of these lizard-like visitors. I happen to know for a fact that they'll be back. Until then, thank you again, Raven, for the amazing entry. And thank you, dear listener, for hanging out with us here this evening. Now, Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Copyright Red Crow Media. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Delaney Powers. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Be sure to follow us over on social media. Give us a like and follow at YouTube. And while you're at it, leave us a rate and review wherever that sort of thing is possible. You can catch us on digital radio, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on Sundown 96.6 and Saturdays at 11 p.m. Eastern on the Onyx Network. Now don't forget you can get bonus content by joining us over at Patreon. Stick around after the outro to learn more on how to join us. And finally, tonight's score was provided by Iron Cthulhu Apocalypse, Co.ag Music, Armchair Ambiance, and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Now folks, tis the season to cause a little mischief. So go, be mischievous. And I'll talk to you next week with a brand new installment. Until then, keep it spooky and have a good night. For the record, I'm not condoning or encouraging any illegal activity. Just some good old-fashioned spooky season mayhem. And part of that fun is sharing spooky and unsettling stories. And tonight's secret entry is exactly that. Spooky and unsettling. Join me back down in Mississippi, if you will. Where Mike has something unnerving for us. This is Mike from Mississippi, and in April of 2022, our house, which uh, my wife's father and brother had built in 1975, burnt to the ground through an electrical fire. Now, we're kind of located out in the middle of nowhere, and I was in the barn when the house caught fire. We couldn't get it out, so me and a buddy and the two dogs sat there and waited for the volunteer fire department came over. My wife was in town at a birthday party, and I called her, and her and her friends came out, and volunteer firemen got there, and we basically watched the house burn to the ground. We live on 80 acres, and we cut seven of it fairly close, and there's one part of back pasture that goes directly into the woods. 
And at about 11 o'clock that night, a friend of mine said, hey, who's standing in the back pasture? So I had my Q bean, took the two dogs and my buddy with me, just going to check out whoever this guy is. And we get over there, and there is nobody. Well, the dew had started to form on the grass, and we looked down, and there was a spot where you could see somebody was and where they moved around, and there was prints. But there was no footprints leading to that spot and no footprints leading out of that spot. You know, I thought at first I was just seeing something through stress. But my buddy said, yeah, there was somebody back here. And the strange things is the dogs were barking, and as soon as they got to the edge of that pasture, they went quiet and sat and just looked and wouldn't go any further. And then it took them about three days to get all the hot spots put out, and my wife's cousin that lives on the other parcel of land and was watching the house for us in case anybody tried to loot, and two different times, he saw somebody in the back pasture. And one time he got in the truck, unlocked the gates that we had let, and went back there. Couldn't find anybody, but he said the same thing that my friend and I saw. You could see somebody was standing in the dew, but there were no footprints coming in or going out. I really enjoy the show. Uh, appreciate the time and effort you put in. Have a great day. That's creepy stuff, Mike. Thank you. And sorry about your house. That's a huge fear of mine. That somehow my home will go up in flames. Unfortunately, fire is an everyday threat up here. Anyway. But what makes this recount unsettling is the fact that someone, or I suppose something, was watching this all go down. And on multiple nights... Like I said, very creepy. But allow me to play devil's advocate briefly, if I may. When I was nine or ten, we were driving the backcountry roads of southeast Ohio on the way back from my grandmother's when we encountered a burning barn. Now, it was one of those monsters built back in the 1880s, probably. And it was lit up brighter than anything I'd ever seen in my life up to that point. In fact, we saw the glow from miles away and followed it up an old dirt road. Now the point is, Dad let us hang out by the truck for a few minutes just to kind of watch from a safe distance. It was sad for the farm, the family, and everyone involved. But man, was it something to see. Again, the point here is that we weren't the only ones. There were all sorts of people that came just to sort of watch solemnly. You could see some in vehicles ahead of us. Some apparently walked because they were just standing around. They all seemed to come from everywhere, even though we were in the middle of nowhere. So maybe it was just one of those situations, Mike. A nosy neighbor that also couldn't resist the glow. And I suppose, I don't know the current drought situation in Mississippi, but if something like this happened here, and there were still active hot spots in the fire. I guarantee you someone will be watching that thing 24-7, just to make sure it doesn't claim another victim. Or in our case, half of the mountain. Then again, it all seems awfully sinister, doesn't it? And what about the lack of footprints? And what had those dogs so spooked? I have very little in the way of answers, Mike, but I... Sure do appreciate the call. This is one that I'll be thinking about for quite a while. Something about it just gets under my skin. Okay then, if you're a Monster Squad member, I'll catch you over on the Beyond. For everyone else, would you like to join us for free? Just visit patreon.com and search for Monsters Among Us podcast or go to our website and hit the Patreon tab and sign up for that $5 level to get instant access to all the Beyond episodes and $1 to get access to all the ad-free episodes. And you can do it all for free for seven days. Plus all sorts of other bonus perks. Sign up today 
and keep the episodes flowing. Plus, after all, that's where you get to hear calls like this one. A rebuttal of sorts from Jose here in my little mountain community. Hi Derek, my name's Jose from Lake Arrowhead, close to your neighborhood. I've been reviewing a lot of Bigfoot in the videos, and of course the Patterson film comes up. And I came across this one video that says there's a possibility of two creatures in that film. So I went down that rabbit hole, and there's a few videos that show two creatures. Of course, the famous one we all see. But at the beginning of the film, there's one walking into the woods, and it's pointed out in the video. I submitted it to the Facebook page. Hopefully you find it interesting, and thank you for your time. Appreciate the podcast. Bye. Thank you, Jose. Now, of course, he's referring to the Patterson-Gimlin film, a film shot by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin that purportedly shows a Sasquatch up in Northern California. But in the film, there's...